This is Mishmash, a weekly conversation where we try to unjumble an important and sometimes under the radar statewide story that affects you. I'm Shayna Roth. And I'm Alethea Kasbin. Shayna, it has been months since Mishmash last discussed potential campaign finance reform. And that is because the legislature has not taken action this year despite several former officials and well known fundraisers being charged, with no convictions up to now, of campaign finance related crimes. We last brought up this issue in April when former House Speaker Lee Chatfield was charged with misusing nonprofit funds often used by legislators. Because of records released based on that investigation, the Department of State said it has found errors and potential law violations in Chatfield's state-level candidate and political action committees. Because the Department of State lacks some oversight over candidate committees they use to raise money at the state level, these potential violations wouldn't have been found without this other criminal investigation. Chatfield isn't the only one. Two of his former aides were recently bound over for trial on embezzlement crimes related to nonprofit funds. Well-known fundraisers in the Lansing world have been charged by the attorney general. One was actually bound over and the other is still in the preliminary phase. So there's a lot going on here. And while all of the people we have talked about have said that they are innocent of any crimes, there are still clear holes in our campaign finance laws. Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson and Attorney General Dana Nessel have been advocating for greater enforcement power and more disclosure requirements. But so far, there has been no real traction on this issue. Some legislation has been introduced in the House, and at least one committee hearing occurred in April. These bills would require the registration of nonprofit funds, require more disclosure, and allow the Department of State real-time enforcement power on violations. But those bills haven't moved. We talked to Craig Monger with the Detroit News, who has spent years scrutinizing the state's campaign finance landscape. Here is some of what he had to say. When I first came here about a decade ago and started writing about money and politics and the use of nonprofits to kind of shield where money was coming from and where it was going, there was a a fundraiser who would say to me often, if it was so bad, why isn't anyone being criminally charged? Mm. Why isn't there crimes being uncovered? And and for a long time, there weren't. And now all of a sudden, there is. Um, But that doesn't necessarily mean that the legislature is going to do anything about it either. So. Campaign finance is an issue you often hear lawmakers talk about and campaign on, but new requirements and enforcement don't get a lot of attention once they're actually in office. It's a great talking point on the trail, but they seem to get amnesia once they can actually pass a law (laughs) that would affect their office. Agree, Shana. But two of the state's top officials continue to call for this. Given the various charges we have seen this year, I think it has to be on some lawmakers' lame duck to-do list after the election this year. However, we also know that list is long and time is short. It seems the post-election to-do list for the legislature grows longer every day. In the end, it might be too many bills and not enough time. But we're going to take a short break there. And when we come back, we're going to have our full conversation with Craig Mogger from the Detroit News. Stick around. Welcome back to Mishmash. I'm Shana Roth. And I'm Alethea Kasbin. Today, we're joined by Craig Mogger, politics reporter at the Detroit News. Craig, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I, I, I noted that I was like the 10th Capitol reporter you've had on. Why Why is this happening? <laughs> the ranking of this. Why Why is it taking so long? You know, it's just the time was right, Craig. You're the looking away right. from me. Yes. You're not answering directly. The time was right. What Craig, does that mean? We're doing the interview here. Okay, all right. All we right. had to bide our time the until we turned. were sufficiently prepared to have you on. Oh, we okay. wanted to That's... make sure we were at our best before having the Craig Mogger on. And Craig... <laughs> We are so excited to have you because we want to talk about campaign finance, which for many years was your bread and butter, and you continue to be my, at least, personal go-to person for all things campaign finance. So first, what the heck is going on in Lansing right now with multiple charges pending against top former officials, their aides, and well-known fundraisers? It seems like it's, you know, it's, it's charges palooza over there. It is. I mean, it's really unprecedented what we've seen happen uh, in terms of criminal investigations into Lansing's state government. And it's 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 been a wild thing to, to document and write about, to have multiple former House speakers, 
one who was sentenced to prison, one who was facing a massive uh, potential criminal trial over charges against him and Lee Chatfield, to have both of those playing out, to have a number of lobbyists and fundraisers and consultants also being um, hauled in to, to courts to face criminal charges is not something that normally happens here. I, I think about often um, when I first came here about a decade ago and started writing about money and politics and the use of nonprofits to kind of shield where money was coming from and where it was going, there was a, a fundraiser who would say to me often, if it was so bad, why isn't anyone being criminally charged? Mm. Why isn't their crimes being uncovered? And, and for a long time, there weren't. And now all of a sudden, there is. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the legislature is going to do anything about it either. So, Right. And so first, I do want to say it's important to note that a lot of the folks who are still kind of going through the process have pleaded not guilty. Mm-hmm. They said, you know, they followed all the laws. But I think to your point of what you heard from that fundraiser, if this is so bad, why isn't why aren't people being charged? Even if something isn't technically illegal, it doesn't mean that it should be allowed under our campaign finance laws, right? So do you think even if some of these folks aren't found guilty, are there holes in our campaign finance laws that these charges bring to light? Yeah, I think there are. And I think, you know, we're learning a lot more through these investigations. I mean, they're for people who are listening who have no idea kind of what we're talking about, we're this is about nonprofit organizations that are supposed to be focused on social welfare and they don't have to release to the public, no matter how closely these nonprofits are tied to a lawmaker, someone that has a decision over policies that impact your life on a daily basis, they can receive checks, you know, unlimited amounts of money from people who have financial interest in those policy decisions and they don't have to report it to the public. So, I mean, just on its face, we have not known for a long time who was contributing to these organizations and why they didn't want the public to know about them. Now, criminal investigators know they have the information on who's contributing to these. Some of this information will come out. Some of it's already come out in the course of criminal investigations. And we've also not known where the money's going. We've had suspicions that You know, there have been people who said consultants prefer these nonprofit vehicles because they can take a larger cut of the money and no one knows about it because you don't have to report uh, details about uh, what you're spending the money on. If it's in a traditional campaign committee, we can all look and see are donors money going to actually fund the campaign or is it going into someone's pocket? That's important information for donors to have. With nonprofits, you don't get the ability to to find that out. So like in the cases of Robert and Annie Menard, who, like you said, they've pleaded not guilty. They're fighting the criminal charges that are against them. The allegation is that they were essentially using this nonprofit money and some political money uh, through campaigns to, to fund a lavish lifestyle and to use the money to buy goods for themselves and They were filing false documents to get this money from the account. So, I mean, there's a lot going on here, but just on its face there. Yes, there's a way that you could use these nonprofits legally and probably not in a way that would be in the public's interest. But the public has not had the chance to know that. We interrupt our own programming to give you an important announcement. Shayna, you know how we unjumble the important and sometimes under the radar statewide stories that affect our viewers? I am familiar with that phrase. What if we did that live? In front of a live audience at a hip bar in Old Town Lansing, perhaps? Sure. That would be fantastic. Let's do it. All right, mark your calendars. Wednesday, October 16th, I'll be there with my wonderful co-hosts, Zach Gorchow and Shayna Roth, at Urban Beat at 7 p.m. to do a live mishmash recording. And we want you there. Yes, look for the event on Facebook, Gong War, or WDET's website to secure your spot for the first ever live mishmash recording with the Gong War News team. Seating is limited. We will have guests. We'll talk about political topics like the presidential election, and we'll also be able to hear from you. You don't want to miss it. Wednesday, October 16th at Urban Beat at 7 p.m. It'll be a mishmashaganza. Now we'll bring you back to our regular scheduled programming. So we've identified some of these holes. Are there any bills out there to fix them? And what would they do? You know, there's a bill package out there that a group of progressive House Democrats sponsored that is a kind of a half step toward the transparency with these accounts. And it it says 
you have to identify if you have one of these accounts. And that would make our jobs easier to at least know who all has one of these accounts. You know, we tried to, when I was working uh, before at the Michigan Campaign Finance Network, and I was partnering with Emily Lawler, who was then at MLive, and we did an investigation where we tried to figure out how many of these accounts are there. And we found about half of the legislature had one of these accounts. We don't know if that's all of them, but we know at least half of them do. And, uh, you know, just having the lawmakers having to identify, uh, I do use a nonprofit account to raise secret money would be a, a step that provides information, but it wouldn't show who's giving, it wouldn't show what they're using it for, it wouldn't show how much money they're raising through these various accounts. Uh, but it is one bill that's out there. Importantly, it hasn't moved. There hasn't even really been a committee hearing on it. No, they held a committee hearing on, I think, two of the bills yes. in this, what, seven bill package. And yeah, they haven't seen, you know, very much movement. Um, sort of to your point, though, like, do you think that these go far enough? Is there anyone out there saying we need to do more? Yeah, I think there are lawmakers who are saying we need to disclose these contributions. There are lawmakers who have said that they don't think it's possible to get it done right now. I mean, they don't think the legislature will let a bill that forces these nonprofit accounts to disclose. They don't think the legislature would approve that bill. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of where it stands. They, they don't think it's feasible uh, to bring transparency to these accounts. I mean, it's kind of wild because, of course, for something to happen here, the lawmakers who are benefiting from the system would have to be the ones that say, hey, enough is enough. We got to stop doing this. Um, and they're not showing they're they're going to do that. And, you know, they get perks from these accounts. They can fund backpack drives and charity events in their communities. They can potentially buy tickets to sporting events. You know, lobbyists are essentially now not able to provide free gifts as sporting tickets to, to lawmakers. And a way around that is to have the lobbyists give money to a nonprofit and the nonprofit buy the ticket. And essentially for lawmakers to stop this, they'd be cutting off those type of perks, having the backpack drives, having the charity events in their communities, getting to go to certain junkets that happen all over the world. Uh, they fund those types of trips. We've seen that uh, in the case of Lee Chatfield through these accounts. I mean, not getting, they would, they'd be telling themselves, Hey, I'm no longer going to allow some anonymous donor to pay for me to go to Hawaii for a week. I mean, that's what these accounts have been used for. And they've shown no willingness to shut off that kind of faucet of, uh, of free stuff. So given all of this, do you think we can really count on lawmakers to ever tackle this issue? I hate to say on that because I don't know what, what will happen, but I, you know, it's a huge indication if they're not willing to do anything about this now, when, what would have to happen for them to do something about this? I think the chatter in Lansing for a long time had been, eventually there's going to be some major crime, some major controversy, and they'll have to do something about it. Well, now we've had not just one major crime or controversy, we've had a series of them, and they're still not willing to do anything about this particular issue. You know, they'll say, hey, we do, We have some type of personal financial disclosure now. We're looking at FOIA. None of that gets to this issue of people who want certain policy decisions from the legislators being able to give them six-figure checks secretly and the legislators being able to benefit from those checks and telling their voters, you don't get to know that that transaction has taken place. When we, when Mishmash talked about this in April, after the Lee Chatfield charges came out, I think Zach Gorchow, our other co-host yeah. said, if the Lee Chatfield charges are not going to lead mm -hmm. to changes here, what will? We saw these bills shortly after that, and we have not seen movement. We've seen Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson calling pretty strongly for increased enforcement. We've seen Attorney General Dana Nessel calling pretty strongly for this, and yet lawmakers are very, very slow to move. So it is really hard to envision, especially when you're mm -hmm. talking about former Speaker Chatfield, who a lot of people were pointing to before the crimes as like sort of an example of how to not do some campaign finance things that Democrats aren't, you know, jumping on this. So it's yeah. and that's the tell here. Like, that's an important point that I think people miss. The attorney general 
this is not an issue she was talking about before all this happened. This is not like she set out when she became attorney general to say, I'm going to do something about transparency in Lansing. That was not something she talked about. She was able to get all these investigative records. I mean, she can have subpoenas and figure out who's donating to these accounts and what they're using it for. She has that information. She's one of a handful of people that actually knows what's going on. And she's telling the lawmakers, you have to, you need to do something about this. And their, their response to her is, uh, we'll, we'll just ignore it right now. I mean, that's a wild thing. And she, and she is taking grief from some lawmakers for her actions on this. So, so the idea that she's just doing this for some type of personal acclaim is not an idea that I buy into from the facts that I am able to see. So I wonder, given that we have issues with lawmakers essentially refusing to tackle this. Is this an issue that's ripe for a ballot initiative? I mean, are there any citizen-led groups or nonprofits that are like, look, I'm sick of this. We're just going to let the people decide. It doesn't. I, I've always thought that that seems far-fetched because if you look at who funds ballot initiatives in Michigan, it's a lot of nonprofits that raise money in secret <laughs> and spend it in secret. I mean, voters, not politicians, people describe that as a grassroots movement that happened because some st citizens stood up and did it. It was to a certain extent, but what pushed it across the finish line was there was, a, helped push it across the finish line was at the end, some very large organizations that raised money from secret donors got involved and run a, ran a bunch of TV ads. It might've passed without that. I mean, I will say it could have passed without that money, but that did happen. There are the groups, it takes an incredible amount of money to fund a ballot initiative and, and people who say, oh, you know, the public's against this. The public should circulate petitions and figure this out and do something about it. It's just not really a feasible idea. I mean, this is somewhat complex. It, it's, it's about the laws of campaign finance. And even the lawyers who work in this don't understand some of this stuff. And, and, and asking the public, hey, public, run <clears throat> some initiative campaign to combat this nonprofit fundraising that the lawmakers are benefiting from and won't do anything about it is wild. To put that on the public is just a strange thing. It's an interesting, I think, kind of double-sided coin, right? Like it's, I think the public would support it, right? Every, mm. almost every lawmaker includes some sort of campaign finance reform, like mm -hmm. on a mailer or something. It's a very popular issue when you're running yeah. for office. Not so much once you get into office, but like you said, you know, it doesn't, you need money, you need money, you need attorneys, you need someone to write it to make mm -hmm. sure it works. Like who's going to write what novice out there is going to write a campaign finance law. So that is interesting. If, you know, to that point though, let's say it did get on the ballot. Let's say mm. this happens. Um, do you think it's something that the public would be interested in or not care about? Oh, I think it's something that would, that would, you know, pass overwhelmingly because two reasons for that. I mean, think about when they wanted to change term limits, what did they pair the term limits change with mm -hmm. to help sweeten the deal? Transparency of the money in Lansing. Uh, and that was a sweetener and that passed overwhelmingly. I mean, there's a huge public hunger on both sides of the aisle to stop these type of swampy tactics that are going on, raising money in secret. People don't like that on either side of the aisle. Uh, and it's and, and this issue, the other thing about it is you can combat this issue without inhibiting anyone's First Amendment rights. I mean, that's just a fact. And the argument that is used against like campaign finance reform measures is you're restricting someone's ability to speak publicly. These people are not speaking publicly. They're writing checks in secret to lawmakers, people who choose to run for office. Um, and and they choose in doing so to abide by some ethical standards about how they're going to represent people. And, and so it's different than, than, than some other campaign finance reform, like capping someone's ability to contribute to a candidate. We have contribution limits on giving to candidates and open. People can't give certain amounts above directly to a candidate. Th that's what this is. They're giving it to a nonprofit run by a lawmaker. Uh, so I think the public would support it if it was on the ballot. I think there's polling that indicates the public would support it. But again, getting it to that point is difficult. And and seeing a path for it, if there's not a path right now, when does the path happen? I, I, I don't know. 
Well, Craig, I don't know if anyone is going to feel better after listening to our conversation, but we appreciate you <laughs> hey. joining us today. <laughs> I'm not, I, you know, I'm accustomed to that. Maybe sometimes, <laughs> maybe someone was feeling too high today and they're like, yeah, I need, I need to feel worse. So here we are.